the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Tonight's Pacific story comes to you as another public service with drama of the past and present and a special message from Vice Admiral William A. Calhoun, Commander of the United States Navy Service Forces of the Pacific. Manchuria's Puppet Government. Majesty. Eh? Your Majesty, is anything wrong? No. No more than usual, Chen. You were sitting here looking out of the window as if you saw nothing. I was looking at that barbed wire fence around my palace out there. Electrified barbed wire. And they call me Emperor. Shall I play the phonograph for you? No. Uh, someday things will be better, Your Majesty. A man cannot live forever on dreams of future power. Why do you not go out and take a ride on your bicycle? Why not? He put on his coat and went down to his bicycle. I watched his tall, stooped figure. Thirty-eight years old, and he looked much older. Six feet tall and more, and weighing only 102 pounds play his phonograph and ride his bicycle and look out over the electrified barbed wire fence around his palace. That is all he does. I watched him get on his bicycle and move slowly away. I could hardly realize that this man was the puppet of the Japanese here in Manchuria. He has been a puppet for one force and another all his life. It started when he was a baby. What is it? What do you want at this hour of the night? I bring a message from the Empress Dowager. The Empress Dowager? Yes, let me in at once. One moment. Come in. It is very urgent. The young Emperor Kwang Su is dead. Emperor Kwang... Dead? He was virtually a prisoner of the Empress Dowager. He was found strangled to death. Oh. The Empress Dowager commands that I return with the young child. But he's sleeping with the storm outside. The Empress Dowager commands that he be brought to the palace tonight. He is to be the new emperor. I watched the Empress Dowager during the ceremonies. For 50 years, she had been the power behind the throne through her influence over the Manchus. I crown the emperor of China, son of heaven, emperor of the world, and lord of a million years. When the ceremonies were over, the child was taken into the palace within the forbidden city to be brought up in pomp and ritual and fear. An emperor, two years old. She'll bring him up as she wishes. He'll be nothing but a puppet. So they gossiped around the palace. She'll manipulate him as she has manipulated so many others. She was as fierce and as powerful as all the Manchu rulers that had gone before her. She'll bring up the boy to rule as she has ruled. That was an uneasy night at the palace. We waited for the next morning, when we knew the Empress Dowager would start spinning her web around the boy. But the next day, the palace echoed with other news. The Empress Dowager is dead. 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 It was true. The Empress Dowager died the day after the ceremonies. 
That changed things. Inside the palace walls, the child was reared in the medieval traditions of the Manchus. And outside, we heard the rumble of the coming revolution. Down with the Manchus! Down with the Manchus! Long live the revolution! Long live freedom! Long live the republic! Long live the republic of China! The revolution was far away, but we knew that one day it would come to our palace in Peking. And at last it did come. The revolutionaries stormed in and took the boy emperor. No harm will come to the child. But he's only a helpless baby. What are you going to do with him? He will go right on living here in the palace. Oh, the poor child. He will always have plenty. The Republic will pay $4 million a year for his support. But we will also see that he is never again used as a puppet for the designs of those who use him for their own benefit. <laughs> The Manchu dynasty had been toppled from the throne, but there were still forces in China trying to restore it. They plotted and planned for the next five years while the boy was growing up. The boy scarcely knew what was happening around him, and yet he was the center of the plans. The boy has no direct claim on the throne. But nevertheless, General Chong Sung will try to put him on the throne and use him as a puppet. We must say that the boy is never enthroned again. Assassination is not the solution. The restoration plot came to a head in 1917. General Chang Soon put the boy back on the throne. Like a pebble swept up by a wave, the bewildered boy found himself on the crest once more. But only for eight days. Then he was forced to abdicate again. He scarcely knew what was happening to him. He hardly seemed aware of the clouds of trouble that were gathering over him. He lived a sheltered life, but he was always in the minds of important men. As long as Henry Puyi is in Peking, the Republic of China is in danger. General Feng kept his eye on Henry Puyi. He is a constant reminder of the Manchu dynasty. Yes, the very fact that he is here in the capital is dangerous. Every time there is trouble in the government, there is talk of restoring him to the throne. We must get him away from Peking. That may call attention to him and react against us. First, we will take away his title. Yes. He has kept up all the Manchu traditions and ceremonies. Exactly. Without the title, all his traditions and ceremonies would have no meaning. Uh, what of his pension? We will reduce that. By that time, his advisors will see the straws in the wind and will get him out of Peking. We who were around Puyi saw the straws in the wind, and the Japanese saw them too. They saw the value of Puyi as a puppet as well as the Dowager Empress and General Chang soon had seen it. I went with him when he left the palace and went to the house of his father. And from there to the Japanese concession in Peking. We were there three months. Guests of the Japanese. Puyi and his wives and us retainers. One night, several important Japanese came in. You must know, Your Majesty, that we have only your welfare at heart. We appreciate your hospitality. The Chinese have broken every promise they made to you. They drove you out of the palace. They dared to rob you of your heaven-sent title. And they even reduced your pension. And you think I am in danger here? No one can know how great the danger is. It will be necessary for us to go at once. But I am very tall to be wearing a uniform like this one. It fits very well. It was made especially for your majesty. But the uniform of a Japanese soldier is not quite the thing for me. In that uniform, you will never be questioned as you go out of the concession. You will pass for a Japanese soldier. Yes, the car is waiting outside for you. But why cannot you tell me where I am going? It is best not to reveal that now. If anyone should stop us, I will do the talking. You look very fine, Your Majesty. Are you ready to go now? Yes. Through the windows, we watched him walk out. A guard stepped up and halted them. The one Japanese spoke briefly to him. He stepped aside, and with the two Japanese, they got into the automobile and drove away. It was a long time until we learned where they had taken Mr. Puyi. 
for that is what everyone called him now. Then one day, we were sent for. When they took us to the Japanese legation in Tintin, we knew that the Japanese had planned for Mr. Bui, and we were to find out that they were to be very patient about the development of these plans. Chen. Yes, Mr. Pui. Are these rumors true about the Chinese blowing up the tracks of the South Manchuria Railroad in Mukden? I... I do not know, Mr. Pui. I have been informed that the Japanese have found it necessary to occupy most of Manchuria. The Japanese have told us that, too. Why have they not given us any official information about what has happened? Could it be that they have special reasons for not telling us? Well, what would make you think that, Chen? It must be apparent that the Japanese have befriended us here all these years for some reason. Befriended? They have supported us. It was just a few weeks after this that a Manchurian nobleman came to see Mr. Puyi. I am honored to be in your presence, Your Majesty. The Manchurian nobleman looked suspicious to me. I come as uh, one of your loyal subjects, Your Majesty. You have come a long way. I come to ask uh, uh, that you return to the throne of the ancient Manchus. I feared you would say that. Your people need you, Your Majesty. Never shall I return. The uh, uh, Japanese are much in favor of your return. And the words I speak have their sanction. I have, I have no wish to return to the throne. Twice I have been forced to abdicate. We as Manchurians are weak. But with the powerful Japanese behind us, is it wise or prudent not to accept their invitation to return? I am still in a Chinese city surrounded by some of my Chinese friends. No, no, I will remain here in Tintin. The next day... We learned that the Manchurian nobleman was actually the Japanese colonel, Kenji Doihara. We knew about him. We knew that where he was, there would be trouble. It started a few nights later. Chen! Chen, where are you, Chen? Mr. Puyi came rushing out of his room in his night clothes. He was terrified. Chen, where are you? Chen! What is it, Mr. Puyi? There is something in my room. Something that crawls. I, I felt it crawling up on my bed in the dark. Let us go back and see what it is. No. No, no, you go back. I cannot go. You go. I armed myself with a sword and went back. I turned on the lights in his room, prodded around with a sword. Mr. Pouilly at last came up and watched from the door. There. There it is, coming out from under that silk pillow on the floor. A snake slid out from under the pillow. Strike it. Strike it. Yes. <clears throat> Did you kill it? I've cut it in half. That's poison. That's a poison snake. Someone put it in my room. Someone put it Not in a my word room. was said about the snake after that. Then one day, the second cook came running to us. Mr. Puyi, Mr. Puyi. Mr. Puyi is not to be disturbed. He is resting before supper. The cook, the cook is dead on the floor in the kitchen. Dead? Yes. He was sampling Mr. Puyi soup, soup. I heard him groan. Then he fell down. He is dead. Come back with me. Come back with me. After this, Mr. Puyi hardly dared to eat. He settled more and more within himself. He never went out. And one day, a party of high Manchurians paid us a visit. Nice. Your Majesty, as a token of the esteem and admiration of your people, we bring you this gift. With the hope you will again become our ruler. A thousand thanks. I am overcome with gratitude. I have not seen such beautiful fruit and such exquisite flowers for years. It is our wish that you will think deeply of becoming our ruler. You do me a great honor, but I cannot return. When the guests had gone, Mr. Puyi lifted the parcel of fruits and flowers from the table. He smiled as he examined it. Then suddenly he turned pale. It's metal. There's something metal inside it. Mr. Chen, what is it? What? It is a bomb. A bomb? Oh, what have I done? Is there nowhere I can live alone in peace and safety? <laughs> Thank you. 
Before we had calmed down, the streets around our dwelling were swarming with rioters. Rocks crashed through our windows and the mob beat at the doors. A servant came into Mr. Puyi. They are saying that you have promised the Japanese to return to the throne of Manchuria. But I have not. That is not true. They say that you have betrayed them, that you have promised to be a Japanese puppet. Please tell him that is not true. Tell him that I have refused. There is no truth in it. But now tenseness and danger filled the air. The rioting ended. At night, I was walking through the streets when I saw a great number of men move quickly through the shadows out of the Japanese concession. My heart thumped. I stopped still. I knew something was about to happen. I ran down the street. Hey! You better turn this corner here! It was an American newspaper man. The bullets are spattering all over the street out there. What is it? What's happening? The Japanese and Chinese are shooting at each other out there. But if you ask me, I think it's a cover for something that's about to happen. I immediately thought of Mr. Puyi. I'm going down to the waterfront. It seemed that he must have information about the waterfront. I hurried down there with him. A big, shiny limousine drove up. Who is that tall man in European clothes getting out of the car? Why, I do not know. It was Mr. Puyi. Well, I know who it is. That's Puyi. All arrangements have been made. There will be nothing for you to do but follow instructions. Now, listen to that. They must be kidnapping him. This way, please. You. Who are you? Well, you are the same man who came to see me as a Manchurian nobleman some time ago. Yes. I am Colonel Toihara. Where are you taking me? I, Japanese destroyer, across the sea to Tyran in Manchuria. I shall uh, see you there in a few days. Good night, Mr. Puyi. In the next few days, the word spread that Mr. Puyi had been spirited away by the Japanese, and many questions were asked. Why did you Japanese take Puyi to Tyran? Why not constant attempts made on his life? He was in fear for his safety. You, as a newspaper man, know how many riots and outbreaks there have been here in Tintin. Did Puyi go to Darwin at the uh, suggestion of Japan? He asked the Japanese authorities to protect him. Mm -hmm. So he was taken to a place of safety here in Darwin. Mr. Puyi was taken to a resort on the seashore near Darwin. And there, on Japanese territory, Colonel Doihara joined him. And while they waited... Important things were happening up in Mukden. And with this proclamation, we give notice of the establishment of the new state of Manjuguo, forever freeing the people of these northeastern provinces from the tyranny of the old government and assuring all a new government of justice and right. Is Manchuria to be no more? That means that the committee of Chinese that the Japanese appointed are only puppets. Yes. The committee has telegraphed China that the new state of Manjoku has cut all ties with the Chinese nationalist government. So this is what the Japanese have been plotting. This is why they've been sheltering and supporting Henry Puyi all these years. And why they brought him to Dairen. It'll be only a short time now until we... It was not long until the committee came to Dairen to invite Mr. Puyi to be the head of the new state. It is too grave a decision to make at once. They came back several days later and brought more than 20 more Chinese with them. I will accept, on condition that I be relieved of my duties at the end of one year if the people of Manjoku are dissatisfied. It was agreed. And on March 9th, 1932, for the third time in his life, he was set up as a symbol. At the ceremonies, I saw the same American who had pulled me out of the way of the bullets the night that Mr. Puyi was kidnapped in Tinsin. He doesn't look very happy up there. Shh, he's going to speak. Heaven did not divide people into nations, but regarded them all as human beings and desired peace between them and love. We are opposed to racial and national animosities. We shall have no political parties in the new state. They make for discord. Our aim will be for a prosperous and happy life that we may... Wonderful words the Japanese put into his mouth. Mr. Puyi became what they called chief executive. 
But all of us around him knew that he was not the real head of Manjoku. Or even the real Japanese puppet. He was just the symbol of the head of the state. The real Japanese puppet was one of the main members of the committee of Chinese who declared the independence of Manchuria. Will you handle this matter, Mr. Puyi? Yes, but it will have to be approved by Dr. Chao Tsingpo. He was the one, Dr. Chao Tsingpo. No, do not misunderstand. I am only an advisor of Mr. Puyi. So Dr. Chao referred to himself. But we all knew the truth. Dr. Chao works hand in glove with the Japanese. He has had close relations with them for years. He knows what side his bread is buttered on. The Japanese have always taken good care of him. But who is this Dr. Chow? This was the question the American asked. He is a lawyer from Mukden, and he prides himself on knowing every detail of the situation in Manjo Guo. The Japanese made him mayor of Mukden in 1931. Will he ever rise to greater power in the government of Manjo Guo? Uh, very likely. The Japanese will give him as much power as will serve their purpose. But of course, they will keep Mr. Puyi as the symbol of the head of the state. That is what the Japanese did. In 1934, two years after they made him chief executive, they enthroned him as Emperor Kang Te of Manjoku. And again he spoke. Today, the country is bathed in the radiance of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Heaven favors only those who are virtuous. I proclaim this the first year of Kang Te, the era of reconstruction. Is that all he's going to say? I do not know. That is all, except a civil ceremony before some Japanese. I have an idea that that's as much as he's ever going to be able to say. Look, the Japanese are leading him away. Yes, sir, the Japanese bring him out, give him about a dozen words to say, and then put him into an armored car and take him back into storage. They drove him in a three-ton armored car back to his palace within the electrified barbed wire fence and surrounded by the armed guards. The Japanese have been careful during these years that Mr. Puyi is not disturbed by the problems of the government of Manjoku. In the first years, he did not wish to stay here. Instead of having quarters here at Tsinking, would it not be possible to establish me as Emperor Kangte at Mukden? That is the vicinity of Manjoku that I know and love best. It is regrettable, Your Majesty that we must have the capital here at Tsinking. All of us knew why. Tsinking is out of the way. There is no railroad connecting Tsinking with China. And at times he speaks of his palace. Tell me, is there any news on the palace which is to be built? There is no new information, Your Majesty. It is under consideration. The Japanese promised to build a palace for Mr. Puyi. But through the years, he has been living in the old buildings which were once the offices of the salt tax collector. There is no reason Emperor Kang Te should not be satisfied. He has everything, and he is paid a salary of $500,000 each year. But where is he going to spend it? That is the question the people ask who come to see Mr. Puyi. But he has less and less to say. Oh, here he comes, back from his bicycle ride around the grounds. Chen. Yes, Your Chen. Majesty. The handlebars on my bicycle are loose. Will you see that they are tightened up? Yes, Your Majesty. Can I do anything else for you? No. No, I will just sit here and look out of the window. As he sits there, his tall figure slumped in his chair... It hardly seems real that this lonely man is the emperor of Manjoku. He just sits there. And I think again of what has been said so many times. Puyi has no heirs. Whom will the Japanese put in when Puyi is gone? He has a brother. And the Japanese have married him to a Japanese girl. But uh, what will happen to this dynasty if the brother has no heir to the throne? I wonder, what will then happen to the Japanese puppet show in Manchuria? And now, a 
special message from Vice Admiral William A. Calhoun, Commander of the United States Navy Service Forces of the Pacific. We take you now to Honolulu. The importance of the complete success of the six well-on drive cannot be overemphasized. The vast quantities of supplies needed by our fighting forces must never falter if total victory is to be ours at the earliest possible date, if the cost in American lives is to be kept at the absolute minimum. I am confident that these two inseparable points are close to the heart of every good American. It is not necessary to point out the economic advantages to be realized by the individual who loans every dollar possible to his government during wartime. Perhaps the most interesting thing I can tell you about buying war bonds is to report what the Pacific Fleet units are doing in their third annual Pearl Harbor Day bond sale which is their part in the Treasury's six war loan drive. Orders from ships of the fleet already exceed $1 million. Outstanding among the early reports received was that from the USS Rawl, a destroyer escort, whose average purchases for all hands amounted to over $45. This figure represented the total unallotted pay earned on board the Rawl for a period of three weeks. The USS Haggard, a large destroyer and veteran of the Marshall Islands and other invasions, has placed bond orders amounting to an average of over $56 for every officer and man on board. I wish that time permitted me to tell you of the outstanding support being given us by hundreds of other ships, the Naval Construction Battalion, the Air Station, the Advanced Bases, the Coast Guard, and the Marine Corps. These figures would be inspirational to all Americans who are interested in keeping strong and inviolate our nation's proud fabric of freedom. If we may count on you to join us within this accomplishment, and bring about an early victory with a minimum of loss in American lives, you will buy war bonds to the limit of your ability, and you will keep them. Thank you, Admiral Calhoun. We return you now to Hollywood. <laughs> been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Jack Moyles. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>